Hello and welcome to Triangulation, Cause-Driven Conversations. This is streamed live and recorded on Friday, June 13th, 2014. My guest today is Jody Jernigan, a colleague of mine uh, when we were both in Houston. And now Jody finds himself in Easton, Maryland with the YMCA of the Chesapeake. We're going to find out today a little bit about Jody's background and history uh, throughout the movement, throughout his 18 years of experience. And if you stay tuned right until the end, you'll also find out a couple of interesting things about Jody. Why, number one, why January 20th is a special date for him, and he's reminded each year, and how somebody contacted Jody 13 years later. You'll also find out if there are any pets, such as dogs, cats, or maybe even hamsters in the Jernigan family. All this is next on Triangulation Cause-Driven Conversations. Well, it's time for Triangulation Cause-Driven Conversations, where we talk with leaders and experts around the, around the planet, quite honestly. And with me today, I have a, a friend, and a colleague, a former colleague, uh, from and a longtime Y guy, uh, Jody Jerdigan with the uh, YMCA of the Chesapeake. Did I did I get that right, Jody? Sure did. Excellent. Well, Jody, uh, thank you for for being here today, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, having just a conversation here. And so we'll start out. We'll just jump right in. Let me know and uh, let the folks know. Uh, just a little bit about your uh, professional background and, uh, you know, c some of the things of where you started, how you started, and, and why are you still doing what you're doing, and why did you land in the YMCA of the Chesapeake in Easton, Maryland? Right. Well, uh, Jeff, thanks for having me, and that one question could take up the entire hour, likely. That's okay. Uh, 18 years, and it's been a long, arduous journey. Um, so I actually got my start at the YMCA of Wilmington in North Carolina uh, back in 1996, um, so quite a long time ago. Um, I actually I got started um, at 96 as a staff person, 94 or 5 as a volunteer at that same YMCA. Um, my roommate at the time, one of them, was actually coaching a five-year-old soccer uh, team, and I wasn't able to make one Saturday and asked me to fill in for him. And So I dragged along another roommate of mine, and we went up to the Y and coached the game, and um, we ended up coaching for the next three seasons and getting to know the Y, and that was my, really my first experience or taste at the YMCA. Um, and so I coached that same team throughout the next few seasons, and Got to know the staff, and um, uh, in 96, the exec came out, um, her name is Perry Maxwell, came out and said, you know, we'd love for you to come on staff, and what do you think about that? And uh, we're hiring for summer camp staff, um, counselors, and after school counselors, and so I thought about it, decided to interview, and got the job, and uh, worked my first summer and swore I'd never go back ever again to the Y. <laughs> And and, um, and and why is that at the time? Do you remember? So I, I do, actually. So I was a, a camp counselor in YMCA Camp Seaweed uh, was the name of the camp, of all things. Uh, it was basically a funeral tent pitched in the middle of a field. And that was the, that was the I guess, the, the summary of that camp experience was um, that's the space that we had. And we managed to average around 120 kids a day and they all had fun and the counselor survived but it was hot it was rainy it was messy and my first experience just didn't think that's what i ever wanted to do uh, but lo and behold i went back again the following summer after working after school and haven't left since so that's that's the start of my career right there wow that that that's amazing actually so i'm imagining this camp seaweed and it was in north carolina as well Greg in Wilmington, uh-huh. Uh, and uh, I'm not an expert on North Carolina weather in <laughs> summer, but I'm imagining not only hot, but probably humid. Humid, absolutely. And lots of rain that summer. It was extremely, it was one of our uh, wettest summers uh, at that 
point in time. Quite a few hurricanes rolled through that uh, that summer as well. Um, but the you know the kids had a great time. We managed to keep it upbeat and positive and creative, and that's what camp is all about. Well, that that's amazing. Actually, it it reminds me that it's what do they call that? A, a this, so from the beginning of the story. It's kind of like a gateway drug is the volunteering <laughs> sports volunteer. You got stuck, you got called, a friend calls you and, and boom, it, you know, that's your one taste. And here it is, uh, what you, 18 years later. That's right. That's right. So, you know, that, that, a uh, little bit of a taste of the why Kool-Aid, I guess you call it, uh, <laughs> turned into, you know, year round work with after school and, then uh, leading that same camp morphed into an environmental education camp under a different name with better facilities and um, into a youth coordinator position, still running camp and after school and uh, leaders in training programs, uh, a few team programs here and there. And um, in 99, actually, I landed my first full-time exempt position as program director at the Stanton Augusta YMCA in uh, Stanton, Virginia. Uh, so left Wilmington behind and moved to Virginia uh, and ran every program that that Y had was my responsibility. And so it was a great experience to jump into some other areas I wasn't used to, but still had camp and after school as part of uh, my responsibility. Um, got to know a, a beautiful new area, uh, a Y undergoing a uh, capital campaign and construction renovation. Um, so a little Y in a small area growing exponentially, uh, and that Y has continued to do that and still to this day. So it's really pretty neat to keep a check on, on the pulse of things uh, in Stanton. So one of the things that a lot of people may not understand if they're not familiar with the way that the YMCA works, at least here in the United States, is that you were in Wilmington, North Carolina, and and then you end up with your first full-time exempt position in Stanton, Virginia. So, That's right. So how do you find out? I mean, if, if, if you're just an, an upstart program director as you were there and, and obviously part-time or, or I shouldn't say part-time, but uh, an, um, hourly, a, sure. hourly, right, exactly. Um, how'd you find out about that opportunity and why? And, and, sure. How, why Stanton? Because it doesn't sound like you're from Stanton or, or anything <laughs> no, like that. Not at all. Well, uh, you know, it was interesting. Uh, in Wilmington, I had reached a point that I couldn't progress any, any further. Um, so I had a decision to make. It was one of, it's probably the first of many um, career molding decisions I've had in my 18 years with the Y. It was stay in Wilmington, find a job outside of the Y. It was stay hourly um, without benefits, but continuing to work for the Y in Wilmington. Um, and as a college graduate, that was a little bit, you know, difficult to swallow. Um, or branch out, and how you branched out at that time, um, this was the day and age when the vacancy list got printed on a paper at the Y or got mailed to us, and every two weeks, I think it was posted on the bulletin board by the copier uh, in Wilmington, and you would take it down and browse through it. And if something caught your eye or you felt like you were qualified for something, then you mailed off your resume. You learned a little bit about the position uh, through a few phone calls and uh, you go out and you, you win the job. And that's exactly what I did um, for that particular position. And uh, yeah, it, it meant you know leaving North Carolina, which at the time I had lived my entire life. Hmm. Um, but it meant, um, pursuing a career that I was extremely and still am uh, very passionate about, um, working for an organization that I cared very deeply for at that point in time and still do. So that was a, yeah, I remember those days uh, a little <laughs> a, a little bit with the national yeah. vacancy list. So there okay. is a national vacancy list. There still is one. It's digital now, of course. Yeah. Um, and, and so kind of the the United States is, is I was going to say the world is your oyster, and that's true to a certain extent, but that vacancy list only covers the United States, but it's still a very excellent way for staff who feel like you felt you had kind of hit the ceiling. That's right. And so you needed, you, you said, hey, this, this Y stuff is in my blood. I want to, I think I want to keep doing it. 
but I don't want to keep doing what I'm doing. And so you land an exempt position. You started with your benefits package. So, That's right. so, and that benefits package also, I know the rules were different, but that benefits package, again, for, for young staff thinking about what it is involved in a career, there's a retirement package. And you're, when you're 18 or 19 or 20 in your young 20s, you are not thinking about retirement. And that's exactly the time that you should be planning for retirement because that's what makes it work. And so you began to enjoy those benefits as well. Absolutely. That's excellent. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I still look at the vacancy list now, not that I'm looking for a job, but I have, <laughs> you know, several, several young staff out there who I've met um, during my time uh, helping, assisting, facilitating the Executive Preparatory Institute and just other people I run across in my, my various um, activities with the Y, uh, that you know I'm on the lookout for them as well. Some of them are looking to engage in a in a deeper um, type of role in the Y, and so I, I constantly browse it. And it's it's a great way to you know just kind of touch base with what's going on out there in the U.S. and um, what's going on in the movement. And it, it's neat to see the new roles and types of positions they're posted and how they're written. And, uh, learning about them individually for sure. So, so you, so you land this exempt job in Stanton, Virginia, and now I'm talking to you in YMCA, of the Chesapeake. So, so <laughs> let's let's pick up the Jody Jernigan sure. story from from Stanton, Virginia, and you're a program director, kind of the Uber director over all the programs. That's right. And then what happens next? Uh, so at the time, I was actually engaged to be married. Ah. Uh, wife. Uh, she was still in school in Wilmington. That's where we met. We have met, actually met at the Y in Wilmington. Uh, she ran one camp and I was working with the other. Um, and so I've, I got to a point where I, I knew if I wanted to actually get married, I probably needed to move back and help her plan the wedding, get graduated from, from University of Wilmington or the University of North Carolina at Wilmington, and then uh, move into the wedding itself that August of 2001. Uh, so I made the decision to uh, leave that position in Stanton. I went back to Wilmington, went back to the Y there, created my own job for, for the period of time I was there. Um, they, I was lucky enough that they thought it was a great idea that, for me to come in and help evaluate and uh, qualify after school and camp programs and start um, or kind of lead the leaders in training program for that summer. Uh, so that's what I did. And it was, you know, it was a decision a very personal, uh, deeply personal position to leave uh, a position which I really enjoyed behind. Uh, and But it was the right decision for me personally. And so that August of 2001, uh, we got married, went on a weeks long honeymoon, came back, packed up our lives and moved to Houston, Texas. And that's where our, our paths crossed, uh, you and I. Um, and so we moved to Houston and, um, Started as program director and then senior program director at one of their facilities, uh, and spent, ended up spending seven years there and got my first executive director role um, of a, a non-facility under capital campaign. Um, the final steps of that campaign and then full construction of a seven and a half million dollar facility. Uh, so again, it was a, a unique opportunity for me as a young executive at the time, 29, um, and. You know, getting to go through those processes uh, of the capital campaign, which was really my, you know, my first taste of being heavily involved with it, um, not just as a program director on the sidelines. Um, but then going through construction and um, the grand opening of a facility and learning how to live within its walls and um, how the community would embrace it and, and did embrace it. Uh, so, you know, my time in Houston, I learned just more information and more processes uh, in seven years than I have probably the, rest, the other 11 I've spent with the Y. So it's, it sounds like you spent about a, a year then in, in Wilmington again, and, and then you launched out to, to Houston and continued, yeah. continued in, the, in, the, in the program space. But yeah, when our paths crossed, I, on, I have only ever known you as an executive director of a of a facility right. so right. this is a series of it's a series of stepping stones then 
that you, that's you're... right. I, I'm probably your typical, uh, or maybe I am a, a typical kind of um, person in a in a now in a, in a leadership level position that really worked through um, the paces of the Y and got to know it in and out every program and service that the Y's offered and learning how to be a leader to staff and then how to be a leader to a larger number of staff and uh, eventually getting my first um, shot as an executive director in, in an association like Houston is a pretty significant thing. Um, it's, it's not an opportunity afforded to a lot of people, but it, you know, I feel very blessed that it was afforded to me and I uh, took, you know, took the bull by the horns and went after it and had a you know, great experience opening a facility that was very successful. Um, after the grand opening and um, you know my time in Houston I still look back at it fondly and um, think of all the things that I've done since then and that I probably wouldn't have been given that opportunity had I not had my time in Houston. So that, that, that's, that's like a perfect segue. It's as if we would scripted this almost. Um, <laughs> almost. <laughs> so you had, uh, it sounds like maybe you had your first taste of, of real uh, financial development work around that why that particular branch right. um, in Houston, which mm -hmm. then maybe that sort of persuaded you to focus on that area because that's that's where you are. That's the position that you're in today, right? It, it is. Um, and, you know, so, you know, 16 years of really solely operational work, which includes programming, uh, leading a branch. Um, I was able to leave Houston um, and um, accept a chief executive officer role with the YMCA in Virginia. Um, and we'll come back to that story because that's a story I, I really enjoy telling because I think it needs to be heard. Um, and then, you know, going to Columbia, South Carolina as a district executive and then um, as, you know, a, a, like a vice president role for program development and marketing and um, some other things as well. Uh, so, you know, I, I really took 16 years of operational experience and just kind of tossed it to the wayside uh, when I moved to the YMCA of the Chesapeake. And, you know, development is a, is a, it's a part of everyone who, everyone who works at the Y has a piece of development. Uh, every staff person has their hand on the development ball, whether they know it or not, um, whether they are told that or not, or whether they're held responsible to that or not. Um, a successful development um, model or you know, department within an association or a single branch is relying upon all the staff involved. Uh, so it always been a part of my being. It's always been a, a part of my job, whether I was an executive director or CEO or whatever, a program director as well. Um, but I decided, you know, I, I have an opportunity to be to become a development officer. Um, at a really progressive YMCA, um, doing great things, growing um, well beyond its boundaries given the small area that we're in. Um, and I decided that it's, it's a great fit and I kind of took a leap of faith and uh, if you heard Malcolm Gladwell talk at General Assembly, you know, he says it takes around 10,000 hours to be an expert in anything. Yep. And so I basically had tossed my 10,000 hours out the door and uh, it started from scratch again, really. Um, uh, so it's been a it's been an interesting journey. It's been a it's been a fun journey, and it's actually a journey that's just taken another step. And uh, and I guess today's the 13th, so in 17 days, I'm actually moving into a COO role, and we've and moving out of the development world, not because I don't like it or didn't like it or wasn't good at it, um, but what we are currently undergoing with uh, three capital campaigns. Uh, we'll have seven strong kids campaigns plus a fairly large and aggressive endowment campaign. Uh, I knew that just two years into development, it was probably well uh, beyond my scope of knowledge. And we probably didn't have time for me to, to learn um, because it's now, it's happening now. We have to strike while the iron is hot in a lot of those. and. So I felt like it was the right thing um, for me as having an opportunity to move into an operations role uh, to do that and to bring someone into development um, role for us who can do all the things that 
um, I was going to have to have a bit of a learning curve with it. So, um, you know, if anybody ever wants to hear a, a, a journey that just continues to be a journey, I'm certainly the case study for that. Well, that, that's actually really exciting, I think, and, and I'm learning some things here as well, since you and I haven't really touched base for five or six years since, uh, since we both uh, respectively went our separate ways uh, in the right. movement. And so that's, that is, that's super exciting. Let's, uh, let's circle on back to that CEO slot that you want to talk about, because it sounded like you've, that's a real passionate uh, topic for you, and, and that's what that's what triangulation is all about. It's about passionate people with passionate topics and, and sharing that message. So let's, uh, let's zip back to there. Absolutely. Yeah, so, um, you know, as a young program director, and, and I'm going to preface this part of the conversation with, I, was, I can tag myself at that point in time to be, um, I was probably overly confident, uh, maybe a little, maybe bordering on cocky at the time. And, <laughs> I'm fully aware of that. I embrace that. I wore it well at the time, um, but um, I'm older now, more mature. I've learned from those um, that that time for sure. And so, you know, moving into, you know, way back when I knew that I was going to make the Y career, I set um, very structured, inflexible, professional goals on myself. Hmm. And so I said, you know, well, you know, Jody, if you're going to do this by the age of 30, you're going to be an executive director. And by 35, you want to be a CEO. So I held myself to those uh, very strict boundaries um, for a long period of time in my Y career. And so, like I said earlier, at the age of 29, I got my first executive director role in Houston. So I thought, hey, here I am. I'm on, on the right track. Um, you know, I opened the Y, ran it for a period of time, and said, well, it's time for me to move on to my next goal, um, which I did. I, you know, went after a CEO job um, very aggressively uh, in a small town in Virginia called Tazewell. It actually sits um, in a county that's right on the state line with West Virginia. Hmm. Uh, so it's a fairly small area. Hmm. It was a construction project without a Y charter. It was a board um, of a hospital who had decided to build a wellness center in town, and they wanted it to be a Y because uh, some of them had Y experience as a child. Hmm. Uh, so I felt, you know, this is something that I can really sink my teeth into. I've been through the capital process. I've been through construction. I've opened a facility. Uh, so this is right, <clears throat> right up my alley. And so I uh, accepted the role after it was offered to me, uh, moved Myself there first, and then my family there uh, a couple months later um, as my wife finished up a school contract back in Houston. And so I had, I had done it. I had hit my goal. And that's, for me at that time, was what it was all about. And um, flash forward, forward eight months, and I was resigning from that same position. And so let's talk about the middle part there is, and this is really what I want to share with people and what I've learned, uh, and I do share this with young staff whenever I get the chance or the opportunity, is I, I came into that situation that I'm the expert. Hmm. I'm the Y guy. I know what needs to happen. I know um, the direction we need to go, and I wasn't very good at engaging volunteers uh, in the process. And I, I know that's a mistake, and I, I probably knew it at the time, um, but I was very bullheaded, and I you know, said, well, I can get the charter, which I did, and I can start selling memberships, which we did, and um, we can get you know, programs started, which we were working on. Um, but I did a really poor job of um, engaging with the board members, the volunteers at that time, uh, communicating with them. Um, and just overall, the sense of I, I hear that you as a volunteer have um, feedback for me, but I don't accept it because you don't know what a why is. And I never said that out loud, obviously, but that's really my mentality at the time. Um, and so, you know, some other things happen. You know, I take a lot of the responsibility, but certainly not all of it. Um, between the board and I that I just knew I wasn't the right person for that CEO role. 
there was a YMCA that was finishing construction and was slated to open um, in the next you know six to eight months and I knew that I had to make at the time what I felt like was the right decision and still to this day do um, that I just I needed to resign I needed to step away I needed to give them the opportunity to go out and hire the right person uh, a person that could work with that board who could serve that community um, and, and do it the right way and probably someone with some CEO experience because I was dealing with things that I wasn't prepped to deal with. Mm. Um, and so I learned very quickly that um, that goal overshadowed my personal inability to do the role. Mm. And so, um, you know, leaving, which, you know, let's talk personally what I did is I moved my family from Houston, Texas to a small town in, in Virginia in the mountains. Um, we knew no one, you know, we, uh, had given up you know, two um, incomes in Houston, gone to one in Virginia, and now I was giving that one up as well. And at the time we had, you know, we had a small baby, you know, six to seven months old and a four-year-old child. And so it was, a, it was a decision that my wife and I took very seriously, but I knew it was a decision that had to be made. No matter what it meant for us personally, I knew it was the right thing for that organization. Um, which was the right thing for the movement as a whole on the national level. And, you know, it, w it was tough leaving that. Um, I spent, you know, six, six months um, really trying to redefine myself. Am I still a Y career employee? Hmm. Uh, am I going to get a job outside of the Y? Is someone going to give me an opportunity now because I've, you know, gone to a position for eight months and, and, and moved, you know, walked away from it. Mm. And so it was a time where I really had to figure out um, what my next steps were. And so it wasn't easy. My wife luckily got a job in North Carolina and we moved there. Um, and, you know, I said earlier I'd never stepped away and I, that was not exactly true. I did for eight to nine months. I was a stay-at-home dad trying to figure out what I was going to do and how to make ends meet um, while my wife was working as a sole income. And what, what, what year was that, Jody? Uh, that was 2008. Oh, you mean the same year as the Great Depression? Absolutely. And so <laughs> interesting sidebar story is uh, exactly so. So, um, you know, here we were living in the Raleigh, the Triangle area of North Carolina at the time. That's where my wife was able to land employment. Nice area. And I was going to job fairs for non-wide jobs, other, you know, businesses and for-profits. And here I am with my X number of years with a non-profit um, trying to land, you know, sales or business types of jobs. And I've got guys surrounding me who have 30 years of experience and they just happen to be let go because their company folded or their company downsized. And uh, it was the absolute worst time to make the decision, but it was absolutely the right decision to make. Boy, that is, that is saying a whole lot, especially when, you, <laughs> when one takes into account, yeah, we just went through that time period where, I mean, long-standing institutions were on the verge of collapse in, in General absolutely. Motors and banking institutions uh, fit, did actually uh, collapse, many of them. And there you were, uh, still standing by what you felt is, this is the right thing to do because it's, it's in your gut and in your heart, it's the right thing to do economically and time-wise, you know, clearly there would be better times uh, to do that. But nonetheless, you soldiered through. So you managed to get through that, obviously. You go back. Your wife gets a job in the in the Triangle area there in in um, Raleigh Durham area I guess right That's in North Carolina so North Carolina is kind of home sounds like for both of you so that makes a lot of sense but you're not in North Carolina <laughs> I'm not <laughs> I am I am a journeyman for sure I'm I'm hoping that that's over for now at least for a stretch of time uh, so you know after about six months I realized that man, I just really missed the why. I knew that that was, um, the why was part of my internal fabric and I had to figure out a way to get back into the why. Uh, and it was a phone call with Gigi Woodruff, actually. Oh, yeah. Um, whom I um, 
have relied on so much and still continue to rely on so much for uh, coaching and mentoring through decisions and situations. There was a conversation with her when um, that finally got me back on the horse kind of. It was, well, you need to start applying for wide jobs. If you think it's part of who you are, then you're not going to get a job if you're not applying for wide jobs. And so um, as simple as that was, you know, I hadn't because I knew at some point I'd have to tell that story. And at that time, it was an embarrassment for me. It mm-hmm. was, I was a failure. I, I wasn't able to, to cut it as a CEO. And um, it was that conversation with her when I, you know, finally kind of woke up and realized that it wasn't about um, that soul experience. It was about that being a part of my story with the why. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was that conversation and that led to a, um, a conversation um, with someone else at YUSA who told me you just got to put the story out front and center um, and uh, make it, just put it out there and let people know what happened um, and then go into detail if, if they ask and if they don't then move on beyond it. And, and that's exactly what I did. So over the next two months, two to three months, um, I was on the interview trail, literally going, um, you know, on phone calls with with the Y in Maine, going to Tennessee, going to Florida, uh, coming here to Maryland actually to interview at that time, um, and was lucky enough and um, am still grateful that I had three very good opportunities come around at the same time, and I had a choice um, again to, you know, we none of them were in North Carolina, unfortunately, um, so it was where we move into. Uh, Columbia, South Carolina, are we moving to um, Florida or are we going to move to Maryland? And at the time, I, um, the best decision for the family was to move to Columbia, which we did. And um, you know, I spent three years in South Carolina knowing that eventually there would be another opportunity here with the YMC of the Chesapeake that would come around. And uh, it did three years later. And so now here we are. We've been here for two years. And um, it was a roundabout way to get here. Uh, but I'm definitely in the right right spot right now, uh, and I have promised our oldest daughter that we won't move her um, for the foreseeable future because she's going to middle school this fall. So I would hate to move her at such a crucial point in her life. That's a yeah, that's a big promise, Dad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when you were in South Carolina, when you were in Columbia, that's a beautiful uh, facility there. The the uh, the original downtown facility just gorgeous yeah. they they don't build them like i'm i'm hoping it's still there right it's, it is yes it is it's so yeah. it's so beautiful i i remember meeting the uh the ceo there and i said wow this is really impressive i mean it's deep south and kind of vintage i don't know exactly when it was built but sort of it's all that vintage woodwork and brickwork and all that kind of stuff but anyway to your role you said you were if I caught this, I'm taking notes here. Uh, you were district executive there, or or, or yeah, actually, I went in as the executive director of their camp facility. Okay, which is in Lexington, South Carolina, which is a small suburb on the west, uh, the western edge of Columbia. Uh, so it's 165 acres of property. Wow. Uh, we had a small wellness um, center facility in the main lodge on camp. Um, but really, programs were our bread and butter, and it was um, equestrian programs like horseback um, lessons, um, riding lessons, things of that nature. But we also did a pretty significant size day camp and after school uh, and a few other things in the community. So it was year-round yeah. camp? Uh, uh, no, it wasn't. It was just, uh, just summertime. Just main stuff in the summer and then after school and team programs in the school year. Gotcha. And so... Um, you know, did that for a few months and then had the opportunity to take it, also take leadership of a family facility in Irmo, which wasn't very far from Lexington. Uh, so then I moved into that district role where I was overseeing uh, two facilities, two very different facilities, hmm. uh, one being a camp with lots of property, one being your traditional family-style branch of the Y. Um, but it was a great experience for me to be able to uh, manage multiple uh, places. And so it was something new for me again. And um, I think you've probably learned that any time I get the opportunity to learn something new, I usually grab onto it. Um, so I did there as well. Uh, and then, you know, in the next year or so after that, I was able to 
um, take over leadership of program development for the entire association um, and uh, oversee the marketing uh, director and all the marketing efforts of the association as well. And so I was able to really kind of fold into some association responsibilities, um, which was, again, unique and new to me uh, for the most part. And so it was just, it was pretty interesting. And that three years was, uh, it was, it was really good for me to get my feet back. Uh, it was good for me to, to um, redefine myself as a YMCA professional. Yeah. Uh, and to be able to reconnect with the organization that I was only gone away from it for eight months or so, but it felt like an eternity. <laughs> it was good, good timing for me to get back in there and really, um, you know, really grab back onto the the organization and get back into the, the movement itself. So uh, I just I want to go back just a, a little bit and. The one of the lessons learned, I guess, that that before we continue on with the sure. next with the next journey, because you're still um, <laughs> you're still not in Colombia, uh, so we got at least we got at least one more leg of this trip uh, to do. All but right. but right. one of the things that I jotted down when you went to uh, the the little uh, non facility Y that that was going to be a startup and get chartered and all that um, is that. When and, and again, you know this and I know this, but this is for the people coming up in the ranks is and it's obviously that it's obvious now that you're looking back at this and saying, oh, that's one of the things that I didn't do that I should have done uh, right. is that who when you're the chief executive officer of the YMCA. And so when you know, when you're in your 20s, or whatever, and you set this, this standard for you to to be CEO. Uh, you think kind of maybe a little bit in the back of your mind, sort of that like you're the big boss, which you are, of course. But who does the CEO in every YMCA, who does the CEO report to? Absolutely, the board of directors. <laughs> and those board of directors are paid or volunteers? <laughs> they should be paid, but they're not. <laughs> Absolutely. Boy, that's a very politically correct answer. Good, right. good one on you. So, so your chief volunteer officer or the CVO, uh, again, we, we can throw, we can banter these uh, acronyms back and forth around, but for young people listening to this, that's your boss as a CEO. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and so roll back this, roll back this YouTube uh, tape about 10 minutes or 15 minutes and listen to what Jody was saying when he was the CEO there and he kind of just wasn't paying attention to basically one of those volunteers had to be your boss. That's uh, right. Absolutely. And, and you were basically telling him, I'm the why guy. I know what I'm doing. I'm going to, maybe I'll nod my head and placate you with what are platitudes, but basically I know what I'm doing. And as you discovered in, in, in a, in a, not, not possibly a worse time in the last 80 years, economically at least, what you discovered is, whoops, not only maybe were there some things that you weren't ready for, but more importantly, boy, you did not get off to a good start with those volunteers. Absolutely. And, and, go ahead. I was going to say, and you know, I think we did a, um, the board and I did a good job of having fiduciary conversations, so we knew exactly where we were with the capital campaign. We knew how many units we had sold of membership, and um, you know that that part of it was fine. Uh, we did a decent job with um, you know strategy conversations of how are we serving the community, but a lot of that was was were things that I had already figured out, and so I guided that board um, in some instances to a decision. Uh, but we were really poor with generative discussions of. How is that why going to truly uh, impact the community, uh, and how are we going to redefine our underlying values? And um, I can certainly, in hindsight, being what it is, uh, I can uh, was able to look back and really just, you know, kind of shake my head at myself and realize where I went wrong and made some mistakes. And um, like I said, you know, there. Outside of that, I may not have been the right person anyway, but I certainly didn't do myself any favors. Right. Well, and, and, and the good thing here that, again, for people, if, you know, I don't know how much of a sports fan you are, but I think you're probably a little bit of a sports fan. And, 
and I use this sports analogy, is that you look at coaches, you look at NBA coaches, you look at baseball coaches, you look at football, professional NFL football coaches, and you know, they're fired. Uh, and you go, oh, oh, they fired that coach. Well, they fired the coach because it wasn't a good fit. And, right. and, in, and in that business, they determine a good fit you know, on a couple of things. One is, one is wins and losses, which is kind of objective. It's very easy metric to look at. But the other one is also, uh, you know, revenue and team building and all those kinds of things. But sure enough, you open up the next, the, the next day's paper digitally or in real paper format, and you see, oh, he got hired over here. So right. it's not that that person is a bad coach. That person has talent oozing all out, but it's about finding the right fit. It's about a Absolutely. fit. Um, Absolutely. So that's, and, and that's, that's what your story says in terms of getting back on the horse in, in South Carolina, getting your feet okay. solidly planted again underneath you and looking for that fit. You discovered that that one little upstart why in that particular moment time-wise and maybe in the context of that why just wasn't a good fit and and kudos to you to voluntarily you know resign with a family that you just moved up there uh sure. and, and that, that's a that's a big decision but i just wanted to underscore that learning sure. there and and look at what happened you didn't give up you didn't fall out um you're back at it and now you're now you're two steps uh, beyond uh, that okay. that spot, which, or three steps beyond if you consider the gap uh, <laughs> that you had there. But the gap was also a time for you to to do a little soul searching, I would imagine. It's absolutely what I did. It was um, it was an interesting time um, just for me personally of learning who I was again, and um, and that's where I made a promise to myself that. My career was never again going to be about personal goals, and I uh, allowed them to get in my way. And so it, it truly is my career is, and I've committed um, to myself that my career now is just about serving the organization, and it's helping to strengthen the movement nationally. And however I can play that role, that's what I'll do. Uh, and it, it isn't about you know I'm, you know. I'm, I turned 40 this year, so I probably would have had a 40-year-old 40, 40 goal. I don't know what that would have been, but I don't anymore. It's, it, it isn't about that, and I've committed myself to that. And It's just about, uh, for me, it, it's about sharing my story with, with young staff and hoping that they hear me and that they understand that what you just said. It's about finding the best fit for you and not just the fit. Um, it's not just something that fits into your your personal goals. It's something that is going to serve you well and that you're going to serve that role well. Exactly. So let's, let's uh, continue on now. So you're all settled in, in, uh, in the Columbia, South Carolina, Aaron, you're probably feeling pretty good uh, about, you know, getting back on your feet. And, and now lo and behold, um, I don't know, but I'm guessing maybe there was only one more move to where you are right now. That's right, absolutely. Um, and so, you know, the opportunity to come to the YMCA of the Chesapeake as a development officer uh, came around. And like I said before, I, I knew it was going to, some position or some opportunity here was going to come back around. It was just a matter of when. Uh, so the development officer came around, and um, when the CEO here, his name is Robbie, when he first pitched it to me, I just kind of laughed at him and said, you know, we're, we're, we're friends, we know each other. I'm not a development officer. And when he said, well, let me tell you what I'm looking for. I'm looking for someone who can engage people in conversation, someone who can tell the YMCA story, someone who has a very personal story themselves, and someone who can just share the overall mission of what we're trying to accomplish in the area. And he said, when I think of those criteria for this role, I can't think of anyone better than you to do it. Wow. And so you I started, um, obviously I was extremely flattered, um, but I started thinking about what that meant for me. And, um, you know, I've always enjoyed the development side of my role, whichever role I was in, uh, because it is about engaging people. It's about building relationships and uh, it's about having a, 
a deeper, more meaningful conversation with someone uh, about the organization. And so I felt like, you know, it's something I definitely have enjoyed. And uh, sure, I'll sink my teeth into it 100% of my time for the most part and um, give it a go. And um, we've, you know, we've made great strides in development and our annual campaign and capital development uh, here in the two years that I've been here. And um, we're building off of an incredible history of giving hmm. uh, in this area. Um, so I at least had that bit of a springboard to, to jump off of. Uh, but it's been fun. Uh, but it's been different. It's, you know, where are all the knocks on my door from, from members who want to complain or who want to talk about something in the facility. Um, you know, no, not that many knocks of, you know, staff coming because they have something they need to talk about. It was um, very solitary to begin with. And so it was a, it was a mental transition for me personally to um, get out of the operations side of things and into um, being you know, in the community dealing primarily with volunteers and donors and, and people who we want to be future donors. Um, and so it was, a, it was a shift, but it's, it's been a good one. So you talked about, yeah, that's huge. Uh, I mean, because I was just going to mention it and you already said it, you know, your, your operations is everything from, you know, the, the, the toilet doesn't work right to the, <laughs> to the shower head uh, doesn't work to we're out of towels to, um, you know, to somebody's, uh, you know, the concussion training, uh, for staff to make sure that they're also, I mean, operations, is hands-on and and time sensitive all the time and it's non-stop uh, almost even outside of the normal normal hours of operation even of a, of a facility why and now you're into the volunteer side of things which is hugely hugely different but it, it's certainly a lot more opportunity to tell uh, to to target a different audience perhaps with uh, with the same story um, that's right and, but I would also think that that development of all things is really more about relationships. And I, I tend to think of, I'm a technician by heart, you know me, but um, I tend to think of development as people got to have deep, deep relationships. And yet with two years there, and obviously at the beginning, when you first got there, you had no time there and probably didn't know any of the volunteers, and yet you've still done, I think I heard you say, if I recall this correctly, you said you had three capital campaigns either going now or getting ready to start. You have an endowment, and you mentioned something, if I heard correctly, you mentioned something about seven um, uh, annual support campaigns or strong kids campaigns, uh, whatever whatever you call them there. Well, that that's huge, so how do you how do you, as a new person, dropped into this? You're an operations specialist. You got 16 years of operations experience behind you, uh, and a lot of deep, deep experience. You're dropped into this to tell stories, yep. um, with no relationships with anybody that you've got to go out and and what I call a grin and grip, right? You've got to go out there and 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 shake hands with people. How do you, how did you get started? And that's that that would be petrifying, I think, to to many people. It could be for sure. Um, I've always been the type of person, Jeff, that um, you, you tell me what what it is that needs to be accomplished, and like you, you hit the nail on the head, it's all about relationships. It's about deep, meaningful relationships with people. Um, so my first, you know, ninety days really was just was a bunch of conversations. It was a lot of multiple conversations with the right people that introduced me to other people and it was about being genuine with them and being transparent and sharing who I was as a person and sharing my why story and um, talking to them about their why story. Why are you connected to the organization? What's your passion? Uh, so it was, it was a lot of talking. It was a lot of asking questions, the right questions. And it was, a, it was just a lot of sharing um, for, you know, right off the bat, I um, just hit the ground running and, um, I'd, I'd say I've, I've just been lucky that maybe it's part of my personality that uh, makes people feel comfortable. So I've been able to really build those relationships with people in a short amount of time. Because um, you're asking people, I, you're asking people for money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Well, you know, my theory is if you if you build a relationship the right way, you never have to actually ask for money. Uh, it'll it'll just be there um, when you share a, a need with someone um, with the right person. And that's what it's all about. It's uh, connecting people and their passions with something that we're doing at the Y, hmm. and then hmm. helping them understand how they can help us uh, fund it with their you know their, their money or their talents or whatever the needs are, if it's volunteer support with hands-on hours or you know, whatever the need is, that's solely what it's about. Uh, so being able to, to just share with people and show people the need and put their eyes on it, um, you know, you never actually have to ask for money often. Uh, it's usually just there when you need it. And uh, here, like I said, I had a really, we have a really amazing historical group of donors who hmm. continue to just pour out their hearts and, and their, their wallets when we need them. And um, we're, you know, we're just very blessed to be in a situation like we are. And so that probably led, you know, it's probably a little bit easier for me, given the personality I am, just to engage those people in conversation. So, um, so it, it's, it's been good, you know, two years. And I would say I have, you know, very good friends in this area that are also donors of the Y. And, um, uh, you know, we, my wife and I both feel very um, entrenched in the community and the people who are here. Well, that's, that is a, an interesting part. I spent a few years in Baltimore myself, so I know a, a little bit of the, although I guess that would be considered kind of the big city, but, um, <laughs> it you know, it, it's, there's some long, deep family roots back in that part of the country. Not, not that there isn't in North Carolina and South Carolina, but sure. there is just especially tight knit families, families that are, that are living in their grandparents' house because it's been passed okay. along from generation to generation. So that's, mm -hmm. that's an amazing part of the country. And again, that, yeah. I, I don't think it's just luck. Uh, that obviously it has something to do with your personality because when you come into that, you could be either looked at as an outsider. Sure. Uh, and, and if you had walked in, maybe, maybe here's, here's a, here's an angle. If you had walked in with the same angle in Easton and the same attitude that you walked into in that, what, what was the name <laughs> of that town? Taswell. Taswell, Taswell, yeah. Virginia. Do you think, do you think I'd be talking to you today in Easton or you'd be somewhere oh, yeah. else? I wouldn't have lasted very long. I wouldn't have, <laughs> wouldn't have had very good luck for sure. Uh, but luckily I was smart enough and smart enough to learn from that situation and do things a lot differently, both in Columbia and here. Well, because, because I, I want to draw, I want to draw the, these are bookends that we're talking about here. One is a bookend where you didn't, you basically just thumbed your nose at the volunteers. And the other is a bookend that you're spending all your time, virtually all your time, is with it was with uh, not even policy volunteers. Some obviously policy volunteers, but some just community volunteers in terms of donors and prospects. Um, that's right. That that's a 180 degree turnaround. Absolutely. And, and so that that's important to know. I, I I like to look at those kinds of things again in hindsight, but it's for people that say, hey, look. Well, Jody was a flop with volunteers. No, <laughs> no, that was just one instance that that okay. wasn't a good fit. And now you've gone full circle. And, That's right. and I think you've got one other leg of that. You said something about 17 days or something like that. Uh, you're moving on, you're getting back into operations? That's right. Uh, um, well, the 1st of July, I actually moved into the chief operating officer role. Uh, for our organization uh, here in Maryland. And so I'm, you know, I'm extremely excited about um, having um, leadership over the executives and being able to coach them through um, decisions and situations and how, um, you know, that what are their development needs. And those are really things that I, um, I thrive in. I enjoy being in those types of conversations and I've missed that significantly over the last two years um, and so I'm, you know, I'm ready to jump back into it and it's, uh, it gives me the ability to pick those 10,000 hours back up and put them back in my pocket and move forward with them and continue to build on them um, as we continue to grow and expand here on the eastern shore. 
Well, Jody, you, you've shared a lot of your journey through the Y, and this is going to be one of those uh, great uh, uh, listens and, 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 and viewings if people, when they go back to visit this in YouTube, they're going to be able to see. It's like, no, you know, having a Y job is sort of predictable. Well, this has been anything but predictable. Um, and so as you're looking back over those, um, all of those scenarios now, what would, what would, what, you know, if there's, if there's a couple of things, and I think you've mentioned them in here, but I just want you to highlight them. What are a couple of what you would call, the, those are moments that you were just really proud of that you've left, in a, in a good sense of, of the word pride, um, in, in that you've left a sort of a positive Jody Jernigan legacy uh, in in some of those previous stopping points, and it doesn't need to be even at the at the executive level necessarily. There could be some if you go way back. Think of some some maybe legacy learning opportunity or coaching or mentoring opportunity that that you provided. Just a couple of those, if if you can sure. dig back. Sure, absolutely. Uh, uh, a couple of them stand out immediately. Um, and it really was uh, back when I left my first full-time job and went back to Wilmington. And over that summer of 2001, um, kind of recreated and led the leaders in training program. And so, you know, those are 13 to 15 year olds who aren't really campers. They're not old enough to be counselors. Uh, and so what do you do with them? And so it was a program that I kind of redesigned and said, okay, well, we're going to really turn this upside down a bit and we're going to have them do some community service. And it was really kind of at that point in time where that program was changing or shifting or um, molding itself nationwide into mm -hmm. something new. Uh, and so we had a group of, you know, 10 to 13, we narrowed it down. We did interviews of kids uh, and really it was on an acceptance basis. It wasn't just you sign up and pay, you were part of it. Um, so we really made it something that you had to work a little bit to get into. And I can think of that summer, you know, there were several of those teams that stayed with us all 10 or 11 weeks of the summer. Um, and just recently, actually, I had one of those same kids, um, it's been within the last, you know, six to eight months, reach out to me and say, you know, I just really want to thank you uh, for that summer because it meant so much to me. And that was, you know, now 13 years ago. Wow. You know, this kid is, you know, now a, a college graduate and, um, has moved on into the working world themselves. And um, so that's just one kind of uh, moment that I can think of back at that point. And, and uh, the second one would be actually from Houston. Um, the family Anderson YMCA was the YMCA that I um, was leading at the time of construction and opening. And uh, every year on January the 20th, which is the day that that branch opened, uh, every year I get an email a message from the, at that point, board chair. Uh, her name is Pam, and she still emails me to the, every January 20th and just uh, you know, thanks me for that process and that opening and you know that, um, that community at that point in time was just really special and still is. Wow, so you, you've just touched on, <clears throat> you've just touched on a couple of things there that, that say that you're making you're making an impact in people's lives um, 13 years ago, uh, seven years ago, more, no, I guess, yeah, roughly seven, eight years ago, when, whenever that opened, I, I forget exactly when, but these are, these, are, you, you, these are things that you're just doing in passing. It's a 10, 11 week program uh, yeah. for this leader, leader in training uh, program and the kind of the kids go through and, and it's not that you don't care about them, but you kind of don't expect really that they're going to hang on to that. It's like you kind of wonder, it's like, did I really make a difference or not? And here it is 13 years later and, and, and you, you hear that back. So that, that has to be, that's something that, that's something that doesn't come in, in part of the paycheck. You know, that's the, that's the extra pay that we get, right? That's um, right. That, that, that's just invaluable. Um, absolutely absolutely th those yeah. are those are two great those are that's those are just amazing and and with and a volunteer that that uh 
the former board chair that emails you every that, that's obviously a memorable day for her absolutely so and uh, it's a memorable day for for myself and and all the staff who were with me at that point in time and other volunteers as well and um, it was January 20th of 2007 and so just like you said you know, just over seven years ago um, but it's a it's just it was a very special opportunity and um, I will you know cherish that point in time uh, as long as I live because it was a unique opportunity and a great community that deserved a why a full facility and deserved everything that it could offer uh, and I was just you know I was lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time yeah, you keep mentioning luck, um, uh, <laughs> and that, that's probably some of your modesty shining through here, because I, I think, yeah, okay, w w maybe some of it is, uh, you know, we can't control all of the timing and all of the circumstances, but there's, you know, the message that I want to make sure that people hear here also is that there's a, there's a lot of dedication and talent behind that as well, so it doesn't hurt to have a little bit of lady luck on your side. Uh, but you're not going to get there if you're not dedicated and if, if you're not uh, tenacious and persistent and, sure. and, and professional about everything as you go through. So we're getting uh, right around to the 60-minute live time here. So uh, what I want to do now is, is take a – boy, we've gotten a, we've gotten a whole look at the professional side of Jody Jernigan here. And now let's let's take a dip into a little bit of your uh, of your of your personal side. Something that will something that that you would like to share with the people, and and I and I think especially the the younger people uh, that that would uh, that would be meaningful from from your life that that you haven't touched on. Maybe even maybe even something sort of some lessons pre. Uh, YMCA in in uh, in your family background and your upbringing or something like that, but I'll let you pick. the The barrel is is wide open here, so <laughs> that is wide open, Jeff. That's uh, I just put whatever's out there is out there. Uh, you know, I, I would say that uh, you know I was raised uh, in the South, so I was raised with a an expectation of being a gentleman and being you know, having that, that southern charm that goes along with growing up in a North Carolina uh, town, a small one at that. Um, but it also taught me uh, that no matter what, and yeah, it probably is my, um, I'm just being gracious, I guess, but there, like you said, it does take some tenacity. I was also taught that you can be a gentleman, but you also have to be aggressive in what you want. And you also have to be aggressive in what you're held accountable and responsible to. Uh, and it's about uh, always taking those things, rolling them into who you are as a person, and then pushing forward and going above and beyond what's asked of you um, to get whatever task it is um, need, that needs to be done. And so like you said, with the why, uh, it's very easy for us, um, you know, those of us who are my age and my generation, um, to care about the why, we understand there's the intangible side of the why that uh, isn't on the paycheck, uh, it isn't in the benefits package, but it's there and it's palpable, uh, and it's important to remember um, that you know we as an organization have the greatest opportunity to impact the greatest number of people on any given day, um, and we have to continue to grab onto that, and we have to build our staff teams with people who understand and get it. Uh, and it's about hiring the right people, like you said, and putting them in the right places. And it's not just filling voids uh, in the human resources world. And so uh, it's just taking everything that I've, you know, everything my, my parents taught me and my grandparents and um, you know, how lucky I was to have that kind of normalcy growing up in the family structure. Um, and then understanding in today's society, that's very rare. Hmm. Um, but there's still lessons to be learned from that, and there are lessons that I can share with young staff and volunteers and young kids and families and individuals who are a part of who we are as an organization. And it's just, um, it's just something that I really love doing. And um, at this point, I can't think of doing anything else in the world. <laughs> 
absolutely not. And, uh, I'm just, um, you know, I'm grateful that I continue to land in good spots and um, provide what I can to the organization at that moment and strengthen the movement as a whole. That's awesome. Uh, so let me let me um, ask just a couple of other things here as we uh, wrap uh, wrap this up. Uh, so you are in this context, you know, you absolutely. Uh, it's okay to say that you are one of the luckiest guys on the planet because I know that you are constantly surrounded by three lovely ladies. Are you not? Absolutely. I am. <laughs> so, uh, so do you have it? Do they have any things that that like? Was there a time in your daughter's lives where you need, they wanted you to get a puppy or a, a kitten or a cat or you, you know a, a hamster or some kind of pet thing there or, or how did you deal with that? Yeah, actually we have all of those. We have two dogs, <laughs> two cats, and two hamsters. Um, yeah, it's a little bit of a zoo in the house. And, <laughs> uh, so you know, my wife and I have always said that we'll try to provide, provide our children with whatever opportunities we have the ability to give them. Uh, and for us, we grew up with pets, and so it was important for us to have children who grew up with pets, and it teaches them responsibility, and it teaches them um, how to care for another life, and I think it gives them a much deeper meaning um, of who they are and a much deeper meaning of what it means to be alive. So, um, so, so, which which pet is whose favorite? Which pet is whose favorite? Oh, uh, <laughs> that's a tough call. You know, we just got a a dog, a, a Shih Tzu, recently. Her name is Holly, um, that we saved, and um, I would say she's probably everyone's favorite because she's the newest and she's the smallest and she's the cutest. Um, but we also have a, an older dog who's around eleven or twelve now, and. Um, you know, she is, she's just kind of our special pet that uh, my wife and I have had for a very, very long time. And uh, those, the dogs are definitely on the, the top of the favorites list uh -huh. uh, for everybody. Well, that's, that's great. See, those, those are the little things. I, and I just pulled, I just pulled the hamster out of the blue and lo and behold. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we do. We have two of them. So uh, they're interesting little critters for sure. <laughs> they're night, they're, uh, they're night uh, animals, right? Nocturnal, yeah. Yeah, that little squeaky wheel. Um, That's why both of them are in our laundry room. We have a very large laundry room, so we're lucky that we have some shelving to put them on. <laughs> they can run their little hearts out. They won't bother anyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jody, this has been really a fun conversation for me. You have made this very easy, and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. So I just want to thank you for having the courage uh, to sit down with me and taking the time and, 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 and having the interest to just share your story. And I, I know that there are going to be lots of people, just like, the, just like that youth from 13 years ago, there are going to be lots of people that are going to listen to this and listen to your story and realize, wow, it, not, it might not be a necessarily a straight path and there may be some rough bumps along the way. Uh, but uh, you can you can still come out on top, and you've still got a, a good, oh, I'd say you said you're going to hit 40, so you still got at least another 20 years. Uh, uh, you know, not at, willing to do. At, Yeah, exactly, exactly. So we're going to wrap this up now. I, again, Jody, thank you very much. And we you can find this live. The, they'll be, uh, the live version will be up in just a few minutes. It'll be on YouTube at uh, the Yamplify.tv. That's the letter Y, Amplify.tv. Uh, you can find that by just going to YouTube slash YAmplifyTV. And that will be the unedited version. The edited version will pop up tomorrow. It will be lightly edited. We didn't say anything that we can't share with the, <laughs> with the world. But this is triangulation cause-driven conversations, and if this conversation, if you didn't think this conversation was cause-driven, then I would suggest maybe uh, there's a redefinition of cause-driven in your future because Jody is a living, is living the cause here as, as, we, uh, as we have, as you have heard over the past 60 or so minutes. So I'm gonna uh, end this now, thank you, and uh, I'll stop the stream 
But Jody, you